The peninsula of Arabia may be described as a vast rectangle of more than a million square miles in extent, placed between Africa and the main land mass of Asia. The Red Sea, which forms its western boundary, is part of the Great Rift Valley which continues northwards through the Gulf of Aqaba, the Dead Sea, and the River Jordan, the huge convulsions which produced it have piled up mountain ridges which rise steeply along the coast from the Hijaz to the Yemen, and the land thus slopes down from west to east towards the gentle declivity of the Persian Gulf. On three sides Arabia faces the sea, her only land frontier is the Syrian desert, and as the crossing of these sandy wastes was at least as difficult as landing on her almost harborless coasts. She long remained an isolated and inaccessible country, whose inhabitants aptly styled her Jazirat al-Arab, the island of the Arabs. The climate of Arabia is distinguished chiefly by high temperatures and the absence of moisture. The autumn monsoon deposits heavy showers on the coastline of Oman and the Yemen, but the steep hills force the rain-laden clouds to ascend rapidly and discharge their contents before they have passed over the inland slopes, the winter and spring rains of the Mediterranean region are scattered sparsely over the northern deserts, the Nufid, where the wilderness blossoms like a rose for a short season, but the southern interior is beyond their range, and is in consequence a dreadful waterless waste, the Rub al-Khali, the empty quarter, which until recent times has rarely been crossed by European travelers. Arabia is destitute of lakes, forests and prairies, scarcely a perennial stream is found in the land, the wadis or rivers, which become raging torrents in the short wet period, are for most of the year dry and empty, and a man might cross their beds without being aware of their existence. Except in the high country, the heat of the summer is intense, yet the climate is not on the whole injurious to human health. The dryness of the atmosphere mitigates the strength of the sun's rays, the nights are cool, in winter snow often lies in the highest valleys of the Jabal Shammar, a chain of hills immediately south of the Nufid, and frost is not unknown in the highlands of the Yemen. Western Arabia The mountainous region fronting the Red Sea, consists of three clearly defined areas, a hot, narrow coastal plain, known as the Tehama, or lowland, hills, with peaks rising to several thousand feet, which bear the name of Hijaz, or barrier, and beyond these, a great plateau which dips eastwards to the central deserts. In the north, the land of Midian, the mountains are wild and desolate, but in the Yemen, the Arabia Felix of the ancients, the hillsides receive a substantial rainfall, and grain crops and the coffee bean are grown in the fertile valleys. Here, in the extreme southwest corner of the peninsula, arose the earliest civilizations of old Arabia, those of the Meneans and Sabaeans. Southern Arabia presents an inhospitable front to the Indian Ocean, its long coastline has few natural harbors, and its inhabited valleys lie inland and free from prying strangers. Its principal division, the Hadramaut, was famous in remote antiquity as the land of incense, the gum from the incense trees was a prized article of commerce, and vast quantities of it were bought and burnt on the altars of Egyptian and Babylonian temples. Eastern Arabia is a land of contrasts. The shores of the Persian Gulf are flat, barren and humid, the natives deriving a scanty living from fishing and pearl diving, but the province of Oman is filled with well-watered valleys which run back to the foothills of the Jabal Akhtar, or Green Mountains, and whose palm groves and fruit orchards support a substantial population. The interior of Arabia is by no means all desert, many oases provide food and water for considerable settlements, springs and wells afford refreshment to the traveler, and some large fertile depressions, such as the Wadi Hadramaut in the south and the Wadi Sirhan in the northwest, have served for ages as channels of commerce. The name Arab, which may possibly be connected with the Hebrew root, Abhar, to move or pass, has been often restricted to the desert dwellers, the Badu or Bedouins, and repudiated by the townsmen and peasants, a practice which reminds us that the majority of the inhabitants of the peninsula have since historic times been pastoral nomads. The pattern of their life has remained unchanged through the centuries since the days of Abraham. Prisoners of the seasonal cycle, they spend the four summer months from June to September around the wells of their tribal territory, patiently enduring heat, thirst and choking sandstorms, in October, when the first rains fall, 
they strike their camps and depart for their grazing grounds, which in a few weeks are covered with plants and coarse grasses. After seven or eight months of wandering over and consuming these pastures, they converge in May on their wells, to await with the stoic fatalism of their race the approach of another summer. Their hunger is barely appeased by a single daily meal of rice, dates, and camel's milk, their clothing, consisting of a long shirt, a flowing upper garment and a headdress held in position by a cord, is worn till it rots, and their habitation is a tent of coarse cloth made of goat's hair or sheep's wool, sparsely furnished with mattresses, cooking pots and water skins. Every Bedouin tent shelters a single family, several families constitute a calm or clan, and clans linked by blood relationship make up a kabila or tribe, to whose particular name is commonly prefixed the word Banu, sons of. To no authority outside his tribe does the Bedouin acknowledge any allegiance, his sheikh or chief is merely a first among equals. Chosen by the elders from the adult males of the ruling house, whose business is to govern his people according to ancient custom and to defend them against their enemies. For intertribal war is endemic in such a society, the fierce competition for the possession of wells, sheep, camels and pastures, the only wealth of a nomad people, constantly incites one tribe to launch a gaz or raid on the territory of another. As no supreme public authority is recognized, a crime committed by a member of one tribe against a member of another, unless purged by a compensatory payment, may produce a vicious blood feud that persists for years. The manners and morals of the Bedouins reflect the conditions and needs of desert life. Hospitality is perhaps the chief virtue of the nomad, in a land where man is engaged in a perpetual struggle against nature, food and shelter are never withheld from the traveler, and even a fugitive fleeing from the vengeance of his foes has but to touch the tent ropes of a family to be assured of temporary sanctuary within its domain. Bedouin women enjoy more freedom than their urban sisters, and the heavy physical toil of the camp is shared by both sexes. Pride of descent is strong among the tribesmen, who carry in their heads long and complicated genealogies, to preserve the unity and purity of the family, they commonly marry first cousins. Divorce is easy, a wife is usually repudiated for childlessness. Large families are common, but dirt and ignorance account for the high infant mortality. The threat of famine always hung over Bedouin society, the nomads often refused to be burdened with extra mouths to feed, and the horrible custom of burying alive female babies was abolished only by the humane edict of the Prophet. Whether the Bedouins were the original inhabitants of the country, whether the ancestors of the Arabs migrated from Africa or Mesopotamia, and whether the land was first peopled by Semites or non-Semites, are questions at present beyond the reach of solution. The national tradition proclaimed a duality of descent, the Arabs of the north were descended from Adnan, those of the south from cotton. This tradition is of great antiquity, since cotton is evidently the joctan of the Old Testament, and the famous table of races in the tenth chapter of Genesis, which dates from about 900 BC, makes the South Arabians his sons. The language of the south was different from that of the north, and was written in a different alphabetic script. The northerners were mainly nomads, the southerners settled agriculturists. Whether the two groups belonged to different racial stocks? We do not know. What is fairly certain is that Arabia entered history with the domestication of the camel somewhere around 1000 BC. The dromedary or one-humped camel has been aptly styled the ship of the desert. In prehistoric days, the only form of animal transport in Arabia was the donkey. The coming of the camel effected a social and economic revolution. It was admirably suited both for riding and as a beast of burden, its speed over long distances is three times as fast as a horse, it can go for seventeen days without water and can consume thirty gallons at a time, it can carry a weight of four hundred and fifty pounds, its flesh and milk are edible, its hair is used for tent covers and its dung for fuel, and a caravan party caught in the desert far from wells or springs, may save their lives by slaughtering a camel and drinking the water from its stomach. Once tamed, the animal increased enormously the mobility of the nomads and gave a powerful stimulus to commerce, since goods could now be carried over Arabia faster and in larger quantities than ever before.
As early as 854 BC, an Assyrian inscription records that Jindabu the Arab led a troop of a thousand camels against Shalmaneser III in fighting along the border of the Syrian desert, while the visit of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon, which if historical must have occurred in the 10th century BC, indicates that camel caravans were already traveling at that date, laden with the products of the east, between South Arabia and Palestine. From this time onwards Arabia was drawn into the stream of international trade, and the first civilized societies appeared in the peninsula. It is possible that the disorders in Egypt, which followed the fall of the New Empire in the 11th century BC and led to the loss of its overseas territories, enabled the South Arabians to secure naval control of the Red Sea and establish a virtual monopoly of the incense traffic from the Hadramaut and the spice trade with India. At some time between 1500 BC, two strong kingdoms rose to prominence in the Yemen, those of Mayan and Saba. The former sent their caravans northwards towards the Mediterranean markets, a big Menean colony was settled at Dedan or Daydan in the Tehama, and Menean inscriptions have been found as far afield as Memphis in Egypt and Delos in the Greek archipelago. The latter expanded westwards towards Africa, their ships controlled the Straits of Bab el-Mandab, they colonized Abyssinia, and for many ages poured a silent stream of Arab migration into the African coastlands from Cape Gardafui to Sofala, which have retained to this day a strongly marked Semitic character. Saba ultimately absorbed Mayan and two smaller principalities, Aswan and Kataban, her kings, known as Macaribs, combined the functions of prince and priest and her wealth was largely expended in the beautifying of her capital Marib, which lay at the junction of caravan routes nearly 4,000 feet up in the Yemen hills. Marib was celebrated not only for its temples and palaces, but above all for the dam which was built a few miles outside its walls to catch and distribute the waters of its local river, the Wadi Dana, and so to irrigate a broad expanse of the surrounding countryside. So remarkable a feat of hydraulic engineering argues a high degree of technical skill among the Sabaean people. The prosperous trade of Arabia excited the cupidity of the Assyrians, who built up the first great world empire in Western Asia. The records of their kings contain frequent references to fighting in the Syrian desert. With the object of suppressing marauding Bedouins and securing control of caravan routes, particularly the road through the Wadi Sirhan, which linked the markets of Syria with those of Mesopotamia. The overthrow of the Assyrian Empire in 612 BC brought the Chaldeans to power in Babylon, under their rule, relations with the Arabs were more friendly, perhaps because the newcomers were themselves of Arab stock. The last Chaldean king, Nabonidus, actually took up his residence at Tema, an oasis, an important caravan station in North Arabia, familiar from the references to it in the Book of Job, and left his son Belshazzar to act to regent in Babylon. The Persians who succeeded the Chaldeans apparently maintained this pacific policy during the two centuries of their domination, but when their empire was destroyed by Alexander and his Greeks, the political and economic condition of the Near East underwent some significant changes. First, the Greeks reached India itself, and Alexander's admiral Nearchus sailed down the Indus out into the Indian Ocean and up the Persian Gulf, thereby presenting a potential threat by sea to the Sabaean monopoly of the Indian trade. Secondly, in the confusion following the dissolution of the Persian realm, a North Arabian tribe, the Nabataeans, seized around 320 BC the rock fortress of Petra and the oases of the Wadi Sirhan, ejected the Menean Sabaeans from Daydan, and placed themselves athwart the principal roads running across northwest Arabia to the Mediterranean ports. For the next four centuries the Nabataeans were a power to be reckoned with in the politics of the Near East. And the wonderful ruins of Petra, the rose-red city half as old as time, have kept their memory alive to this day. Thirdly, when after Alexander's death in 323 BC, the Ptolemies established themselves in Egypt, a vigorous attempt was made to restore Egyptian naval power in the Red Sea. The ancient canal between that sea and the Nile was reopened, Egyptian ships passed through the Straits of Bab al-Mandab and made direct contact with Indian ports, bringing back cargoes of pepper and cinnamon, and the discovery attributed to one Hippolys of the periodicity of the monsoons greatly facilitated navigation in the Indian Ocean. 
These developments sapped the economic strength of Saba, provoked unrest and discontent, and led to a revolution in or about 115 BC, when the ancient monarchy was overthrown by the Himyarites, a tribe whose original home was perhaps in the Hadramaut and who under the name Homerites were familiar to the Greeks and Romans for the remainder of the Classical period as the lords of Arabia Felix. The new rulers of the Yemen were soon called upon to defend their land against something more serious than mere trade competition. The shadow of Rome was falling across the Near East, after the Battle of Actium, Augustus landed in Egypt and turned the country into a Roman province, the Nabataean kingdom was reduced to the status of a Roman satellite, and plans were set on foot to seize the incense lands of Arabia. In 24 BC Elias Gallus, the prefect of Egypt, landed an army on the North Arabian coast and pushed down the Hijaz as far as the Wadi Nadrin, within a few days' march of Marib. At this point something went wrong and the expedition was forced to return. Either the Romans were unable to cope with the hazards of desert warfare, or they were betrayed by Nabataean spies and agents they had brought with them. The Himyarites thus escaped subjection to Rome, but they never regained the monopoly of the Indian trade which their Sabaean predecessors had so long enjoyed. For the first two centuries of the Christian era, Western, that is to say, Roman-Egyptian, shipping plied regularly to and fro across the Indian Ocean. Details of this sea traffic have been preserved in a handbook for merchant captains compiled about AD 50 and known as the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea. Large hordes of Roman coins have been dug up in southern India, and at least one Roman trade mission reached China. The land routes across Arabia lost a good deal of their importance, and Trajan in 106 AD was able to annex Petra and abandon the Wadi Sirhan, which the Nabataeans had so long controlled, to Bedouin anarchy without risking economic loss. In the 3rd century, however, the situation was transformed by the emergence of three new factors. The breakdown of the Roman peace, the rise of the powerful Sassanid kingdom in Persia, and the emergence of the kingdom of Aksum in Abyssinia. After the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180 AD, the Roman Empire was subjected to a series of barbarian assaults which nearly brought it to ruin, and in 226 the new Sassanid dynasty came to power in Persia. Persian attacks on the Roman positions in the Near East multiplied, at a time when the emperors were struggling with foes elsewhere. Trade and commerce suffered, and almost certainly the volume of Roman shipping in Indian waters sharply declined. This circumstance revived the importance of the desert caravan roads. Petra and the Nabataeans were no more. But a new commercial center arose at Palmyra, halfway across the Syrian desert, a meeting place for merchants from Damascus, Mesopotamia and Arabia. Palmyra was a very old settlement in a fertile oasis, known in biblical days and still known to the Arabs as Tadmor, but fame and prosperity only came to it when it took over much of the trade that had once flowed through Petra. A self-governing city under the protection of Rome, its mainly Arab inhabitants used its wealth to construct a magnificent imitation of a Greco-Roman metropolis, with temples, fora, porticos and colonnaded streets, whose vast ruins, starting up out of the desert wilderness, still amaze the traveler. For a time the Palmarines loyally defended Rome against Persia, but after the capture of the Emperor Valerian by the Sassanids in 260, the city, under its chief Odenathus, resolved to make a bid for the sovereignty of the East. For several years Odenathus and later his widow Zenobia ruled a kingdom which stretched over Syria, North Arabia, part of Asia Minor and even Egypt, but when the military strength of Rome was restored by Aurelian. The brief glory of Palmyra was ended. In 272 Palmyra was captured by the Romans, and Zenobia was taken prisoner. The city went the way of Petra, but the example of both the Nabataeans and the Palmyrenes showed that communities of Arab stock were capable of attaining a high degree of civilization under the stimulus of contact with advanced peoples. Petra and Palmyra may be regarded as local forerunners of the mightier culture of Islam. Far more significant for the subsequent history of Arabia was the rise of a new military state in the highlands of Abyssinia. When the Ptolemies brought Greek culture into Egypt, some knowledge of it reached the Abyssinians through the Red Sea port of Adulis, which was frequented by Egyptian shipping. 
A few miles inland from Adulis arose the city of Aksum or Aksum, which became the capital of the kingdom of that name. Its sovereigns professed sympathy for Hellenic civilization, and their decrees were issued in both Greek and Ethiopic. Aksum emerges into the full light of history after the Roman occupation of Egypt, it seems to have been accepted as an ally of Rome, and the two powers had a common interest in repelling the incursions of the Blemies or Bages, a savage tribe who roamed the regions of the Middle Nile. Aksum doubtless had her share of the Indian trade, and when in the 3rd century the Roman Empire fell into anarchy and Sassanid Persia became a great power, she perhaps saw her interests threatened by a possible extension of Persian naval control over Arabian waters, and reacted by attempting to gain a foothold in the Yemen. Early in the 4th century, the Axumites invaded and conquered Himyar, and their kings for a time style themselves kings of Aksum. Himyar and Hadramaut. Some time before 378, a national reaction must have ejected the intruders, but the freedom of Himyar was never again secure, and from now until the rise of Islam South Arabia was a bone of contention between Aksum and Persia, with Rome, or rather Byzantine Constantinople, occasionally intervening from a distance. The situation was complicated by the rapid spread of Christianity over the Near East after the conversion of Constantine, which dragged Arabia deeper than ever into the vortex of international politics. The primitive religion of the desert was restricted to the worship of trees and streams and stones in which the deity was supposed to reside. The nomad, at the mercy of a seemingly capricious and hostile nature, was impelled to believe in personalized elemental forces, whose protection was invoked and whose anger was averted by appropriate rites and ceremonies. Yet the authority of the gods was local and limited, vast tracts of the earth were delivered over to strange, supernatural beings known as jinn, whose activity, though sometimes beneficent, was more commonly evil and malicious. The jinn were conceived of as corporeal creatures who haunted thickets, graveyards and waste places, and assumed the form of snakes or wild beasts, they appeared and disappeared with mysterious suddenness, and ruthlessly inflicted death or madness on those who offended them. Nomads had naturally no temples or priesthoods, they usually carried their gods with them in a tent or tabernacle, and consulted them by casting lots with arrows, while their kahins or soothsayers delivered oracles in short rhymed sentences. When a nomadic tribe adopted a more sedentary manner of life, its gods were placed within a haram, or sacred enclosure, usually a circle of stones, and sacrifices were there offered to them, thus the Nabataeans at Petra worshipped their deity in a square block of unhewn basalt, over which the blood of offerings was poured. In short, Bedouin religion was part and parcel of ancient Semitic paganism, many traces of which are to be found in the beliefs and practices of the early Hebrews as recorded in the Old Testament.